we go. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jacqueline Oscarco, the Director of Conference and Events here at CAI. I'd like to welcome all of our attendees, thank our ultimate partners, the Board of Directors, and the CAI team for today's presentation. Just a reminder, we will be hosting these web Wednesday webinars through September. Uh, our next one is on August 4th, featuring Denali Property Management and ResCom Enterprises. Um, just a few housekeeping rules. All participants will be muted. If you have any questions for our panelists, please be sure to enter them into the question box at any time. Um, and if you also need a certificate for manager credits, please email jennifer at caiNj.org. Just a note, you must be in attendance for the entire presentation to qualify for a certificate. I'm gonna turn it over to Robin, uh, CAI Manager of Membership, who's gonna talk to you a little bit about renewing your membership and what we have going on at CAI. Thanks, Jack. Um, my name is Robin. I'm the membership manager for CAI New Jersey. Uh, just to do a little member pitch for renewals. Um, if you have laps, please be sure to send me an email. I'll be happy to get a renewal notice over to you. Um, also, uh, for your board updates, please be sure to send those to me. I can do those at any time throughout the year and make those updates accordingly. Um, as Jackie said, we do have a lot of things coming up this summer and fall. Um, you can register on our website for our next Wednesday webinar, as Jackie said, um, on August 4th with Denali Property Management, talking about budgets and financial planning, and ResCom presenting on the value of workmanship, budgeting, and service for your needs. Uh, for homeowners and managers, our leadership summit, formerly the Senior Summit, will be hosted virtually on Thursday, July 29th. So register today to hear about very important topics pertaining to your community. For the business partners on today, we are offering our business partner essentials course on Tuesday, August 3rd at 1 p.m., where you can earn your educated distinction, which will set you apart professionally in the industry. Uh, the CAINJ uh, headquarters is hosting the board leadership development workshop, which is a two-day program on August 5th and August 6th, where you can learn to be an even more effective board member. So you can register on our website for that as well. On Thursday night, August 5th, the Ultimate Partners are hosting their night out at the Jersey Blue Claws Stadium. This is a free event for homeowners and managers, but space is limited. So please be sure to register early for that. Um, that'll be at our party deck on the third baseline. Uh, we are also hosting a virtual roundtable discussion on August 12th at 4 p.m. And the discussion topics are critters creeping in, preparing for the big storm, asphalt repair and best practices and protecting your association. And then lastly, our beach party will be on September 17th at Martell's and the conference and expo is at iPlay America on October 21st. So all of these events you can register for on our website and we are um, you know, always sending out marketing opportunities for that as well. So um, we hope to see you at our next upcoming events and we hope to see you, thanks. All right, thanks Robin. So our first speaker today is Gabe Vitale from CNL Services. Gabe, Gabe brings three generations and 50 years of community vendor experience through providing pavement maintenance and concrete services. Growing up in the business and physically performing the work himself gives him the ability to understand a community's needs and build a project that satisfies that need within the budget. I'm happy to introduce Gabe, who will be educating you on catch basins, what they are, what, the, what attention that they need to ensure they are properly functioning, and moving your rainwater while avoiding liabilities. All right, Gabe. Jackie, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as Jack, Jackie mentioned, I am Gabe Vitale, CNL Services. Um, got a couple notes here. I do tend to ramble, so I want to keep myself on track. Um, today, I'm going to educate the people that are on the call about catch basins. We always try to pick a topic that we believe the association needs more education on because at the end of the day the goal is to be providing the education necessary to the property manager so that they can properly do their jobs by doing what's best for the community um, catch basins have a lot of nicknames so many times they're also referred to as inlets or storm drains all three words are interchangeable they all mean the same thing when you're talking um, catch basins control and function as the primary water drainage system in your community. So ultimately they're collecting all the surface water from your water, your roads, and they're distributing the water through the piping systems, okay? So what is a catch basin? We all know it's the thing that we see with the grate on the side of the road, but what, what, what is it actually and what does it do? 
Uh, it's a four walled concrete box designed at a slightly lower grade than its surrounding areas in order obviously to pitch the water towards the catch basin. Um, inside it are pipes that connect to other catch basins, creating a continuous piping system that moves your water. If these catch basins do not function properly, your water is not going to move. Okay, it's going to build up, it's going to sit in the road, the grass is going to die from, from uh, being flooded. The water needs to be caught and moved into your retention ponds. Uh, on top of this four wall box is the metal grate that you see. The metal grate serves as a filter. It prevents large debris from getting into the catch basin and then ultimately clogging up the pipes that connect to each other. Um, on top of the catch basin is also a head. And that's probably what you guys know catch basins primarily as, grates and heads. But there's a, there's a lot more that goes into it. That's like the uh, tip of the iceberg that you see. You don't actually know what's, what's underneath. Where are catch basins found? Generally, they're found along the curbs and many times at uh, intersections. Um, so why am I talking about catch basins today? Uh, simply, catch basins, in my opinion, are one of the most commonly neglected um, aspects of maintenance in a community due to the fact that they're unseen. So you can look at a roof and you can see that the roof needs some work. You can look at the sidewalks and you can see that the sidewalks need to be repaired. You can look at the roadway and you can see that the roadway is failing and that you need to repair it. Most of the time, the way we identify uh, in our communities or that you identify in your communities that repairs need to be made is by visually seeing them and saying, we need to be doing something about that. Your siding, your roof, your asphalt, your sidewalks, et cetera. Um, but at the end of the day, catch basins exist underground. So unless somebody, yourself or somebody in the community is lifting up the grate of the catch basin, sticking their head into it and making an assessment as to what it looks like inside the catch basin, you don't know that you need to repair the catch basin until it's usually too late. And what do I mean by too late? How do catch basins fail? Uh, so ultimately the concrete walls that are inside the catch basin they fail first okay over time water gets underground normally through cracks in the road um, the water will get underneath and the water just keeps pushing up against the catch basin because water is or the catch basins are built for water to flow into them or even towards them if unfortunately the water is underground so as the water keeps flowing towards these catch basins, the concrete eventually gives out. As strong as concrete is, water tends to be more resilient. Um, once the water breaks through, the concrete breaks, okay? And once the concrete walls inside these catch basins are damaged or deteriorated or broken, the water now has a gateway into the catch basin that's not on top of the surface. We want the water to get into the catch basin on top of the sur surface. Once the water gets into the catch basin below the surface, then we have a problem because it begins to bring all of the dirt in the base that is holding up your roadways or even your landscape areas into the catch basin with it. Little by little, it drags the dirt into the catch basin, leaving the asphalt on top with nothing to stand on. The asphalt on top becomes a house without a foundation, okay? Eventually it's gonna give in. So by repairing these catch basins in advance or doing maintenance on these catch basins, we can prevent the, that. The last thing that we want is a sinkhole because ultimately when the base and the foundation of the asphalt deteriorates, the asphalt caves in. And when the asphalt caves in, you end up with a sinkhole, okay? At that point, it becomes a liability. It also becomes a much more expensive repair because the scope of the work has been expanded. So if we're able to catch the catch basins before this happens, they're very easy to repair, okay? They tend to be less expensive. They are less expensive to repair. Um, and ultimately we wanna avoid the liability of having sinkholes forming on your property where people walk, kids play, um, cars drive. Uh, we, that's what we want to avoid. And that's what CNL does. So how do we do it? Um, CNL provides a very unique service that we refer to as catch basin inlet storm drain assessments. 
okay? They don't take long to perform, but they're very necessary. So what CNL will do is we will go out to the property. We will lift every catch basin grate, the filter. We will lift the grate, the metal grate off, get inside, take some pictures, analyze how the concrete walls inside look. Are they firm? Are they sturdy? Have they began to fail? Have they already failed, but we haven't seen the sinkhole yet? And uh, we'll visit each one of the catch basins. We'll number them. We put together a nice, we have a nice program that we put together where we number the catch basins. And then we will follow up with pictures for each catch basin, the assessment that was made. Uh, do we recommend a repair this year, two years, three years, five years, or let's not even think about it for five years because it is completely structurally sound. Um, there's a lot of value there for the property managers for two reasons. Uh, one, it's a proactive approach. Obviously we wanna be making proactive repairs because the proactive repairs tend to be much more cost effective than the reactive repairs. And ultimately it is limiting and if not eliminating liabilities uh, as a property manager that you may have of not putting the proper attention or doing the proper assessments towards the catch basins. So this is one of those unique services that CNL provides to its customers. Um, at the end of the day, the overall goal is for CNL to be able to come in and make the necessary repairs. So we do we do the inlet the catch basin assessments uh, in a very very cost effective and competitive manner. Uh, submit that to you. You put it in your files, and then um, you know we have a discussion with yourself and your board as to what we saw, what we recommend, and uh, what repairs are needed, if any. Any questions for me, Jackie? Yes, we do. And just a reminder, if anybody else has any questions, you can put it in the Q&A feature in your window. So our first question is kind of a two-part question. So what is the average cost to repair a catch basin? The average cost to repair a catch basin before it has noticeably failed on the outside. So a proactive uh, repair cost is usually between $1,500 and $2,000, depending on the level of repair that, that is needed. When you have an, a catch basin, you usually have a solid concrete wall that comes up, and then the top three walls are block, okay? So the determination needs to be made. Is it one block course repair, two block course repair, or three block course repair? Now, if we're proactively catching these uh, necessary repairs, they tend to be one or two courses. Where you get into a three course repair um, is when that sinkhole is already formed. Uh, but between 1500 and 2000 for a proactive catch basin repair. And the second part is what is the average cost to repair a catch basin that has completely failed due to not being maintained? Hmm. So that, 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 hmm, that's a tough one. That one varies. Um, I'll give you guys an example. So it's probably about three weeks ago. Um, we did a job in a community where we received a call that it was an absolute emergency. I stopped what I was doing and I went out to look at it. It turned out that it was an eight foot sinkhole and about six feet wide, but nobody knew it existed until the asphalt actually caved in. Okay, so it was almost like an igloo, imagine. I mean, the whole outside of the, everything looked fine on the outside, but in reality, inside, there was an eight by six foot hole. Now, thank God nobody drove over it, or um, I might have held if somebody walked over it, but thank God no cars were driving over it, because it would have swallowed the, up to the hood uh, without a doubt. Now, something like that is about seven dollars $8,000 to repair, um, and they had no clue that it was happening because at the end of the day, like I said, you can look at a roof and you can see that a roof needs repair. Look at the sidewalks and say, hey, our sidewalks need some work. You don't know what's going on in your catch basins unless you actually get inside them and you see what's going on. So at, at the end of the day, it can vary anywhere from 4,000, 7,000, and I, we've even done them over 10,000. Um, and sometimes it's too late. Sometimes the liability's already happened. Somebody's been hurt or something has been damaged. Um, and you don't, you don't know that it's going on. It, it can be pretty scary. Dave, how long is the life of a catch basin without repair? There, there's no answer to that. It's like asking, uh, you know, what is the life of a, of, of a human? I mean, yeah, I'm sure we can find an average, 
but it, it, it all depends on, on what that human, that individual is doing, how they're living their lifestyle. So if the catch basin is an area where most of the water is being filtered to, it might not be as long. If your property, is, if your community is not keeping up with the asphalt, it's going to be a very short lifespan because ultimately when the water gets in through the cracks, if you're not properly crack filling, if the water gets in through the cracks, you have a substantial amount of water underground. Water underground is like the arch nemesis of, of, of creating failure on your asphalt and your catch basins. Um, so if you're allowing that water to infiltrate underground, that water is still flowing towards that catch basin, except it's flowing underground and it will eventually break through. Um, when we come in to do a catch basin repair, uh, we are very confident that that's going to get another five to seven years before you even have to put your eyes on it again. But that's given that the proper asphalt maintenance is done. That is uh, given a multitude of factors. But after a repair made by CNL, I mean, we, we shouldn't have to even have a conversation about that specific catch basin for five to seven years. All right, if there's any other questions, feel free to put them in the question box. Um, we are gonna move over to Joe. Um, Joe, if you could join us back on screen. And Gabe will be available to answer more questions towards the end if we do have any other questions. Sure, thank you, Jackie. And I'm glad I am glad I got to go before Joe. Joe you, Joe's usually a tough act to follow. <laughs> uh, I don't know about that. <laughs> a little different, my friend. All right, well, thank you, Gabe. Um, Joe Bonafetti is from Technicality. Joe is the president of Technicality, a security solutions integration company based out of Hamilton that was started in 2002. Technicality is a full service provider of security solutions for commercial and residential customers, private clients, corporations, government agencies, and institutes of all sizes nationwide. With over 35 years of experience in the field of protection, his services include advanced technology solutions and are continuously developing new ways to put cutting edge technology to work for you. Maintaining a position as an industry leader in the security field from system design and installation to ongoing service support and training. Uh, today, Joe is gonna chat with you a little bit about privacy and security in an increasingly insecure world. Welcome, Joe. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for having us and uh, hope all is well. Glad that uh, these mass mandates are being lifted so everybody can kind of get back to a, a little bit of normalcy in their lives. So can you see, um, I'm gonna share my screen right now and we will go right here. You see that? Um, yep, we see it. Okay, great. So let me just go to full screen. <sighs> So basically, um, like Jackie said, while I'm getting getting this going, Technicality is a full service uh, security company, and we specialize in um, fire alarm, burglar alarm, access control, barrier gates, um, anything actually to do with security. So, do you see that again now? We can see it if you just want okay. to. Make it up. Perfect. Great, thank you. So, okay. Um, so basically what we're going to talk about today is just, you know, a few different things in terms of privacy and security. And uh, there's a couple of things on here. This is usually for an hour. So um, I'm just going to go through things a little bit quickly. And, you know, if, if anybody has um, anything that they want to ask while we're going, just just actually let us know. We'll just we'll just take it from there. OK, so benefits of a video doorbell allows you to see who's at the door prior, prior to opening it, keeps your family self safe between them and the unknown. You know, with everything going on today with, uh, you know, sometimes with people being out of work, uh, you have people that may want to steal a package because Amazon was, you know, was in full force when the, when the lockdown was taking place. Um, it just gives you that separation that you don't have to open that door and you can find out who that, you know, who is at the door prior to unlocking uh, your door. Uh, it's a two-way audio intercom. So basically you, you can speak with them without having to open the door or, or, or through a window. Um, and you can see 
the person um, on a smartphone, a tablet, um, or even speak to someone while you're at work. Sure, drop the package. Uh, the great thing about these, you know, a lot of the video doorbells, they interact uh, with smartphones. Uh, I'm sorry, with smart homes. Meaning that um, if you knew, say, your UPS guy, you could literally unlock a door while you're watching them so they could drop a package inside. Most of the cameras now um, have HD high definition um, cameras on them, infrared. So if there's zero lighting, you'll be able to see the person or persons who are at the door. Um, say your light went out and you know needs to be replaced, you know the bulb or something, then you you know you'd be able to see that. Um, for multiple dwellings, uh, they have newer systems because think of think of the ring doorbell, uh, but they have it for multi dwelling, so you could have many tenants. Uh, say in a high rise, and you have the ability of, you know, I press uh, one for Mrs. Jones, and that goes directly to her cell phone, her smart tablet. Um, and for people who don't have a smartphone, they would just have the ability of just listening to the audio. So I don't want to have to get a smartphone because, you know, I just use a flip phone. Well, then you would just hear the audio, and then you could release a door by pressing either a digit or just chat with them without having the visual. And like I say, it works with the burg alarm system. So you could literally, besides unlocking doors, you can shut an alarm off uh, while um, the, the driver or someone that was making a delivery, um, giving them access to the location. They interact with, you know, smart home devices like Amazon Alexa, Google, Nest Hub, and things that are basically out there uh, for, the, for the smart home themselves. Notifications of activity from the video doorbell can be, you know, it's not only when the button's depressed. So you can have it set up and, and have an, um, a, a, an imaginary boundary where you can set it up where when someone's in front of the house, you can get an alert, whether it's via email, text, and most of these can be, these video clips can be recorded either on a local device that's at the location, whether it's a clubhouse, whether it's the front door, whether it's the front lobby, and you could have that recorded locally, stored like on a mini SD card, or in some cases it'll go to the cloud. So you can access this information at a later date. Maybe a package was missing. Now we wanna see, go back and see when it was dropped off and then who removed it, maybe somebody did it accidentally or someone, you know, there was a theft. I mean, they can uh, also reduce insurance costs. Most insurance companies, uh, you know, provide discounts when you have some type of video or security system installed, you know, at your home or business. So realistically, um, you know, it, it's a good tool to keep that distance from you and the person outside, specifically if you don't know who they are and you want to talk to, to someone that's unannounced, uh, maybe you're not expecting someone. And sometimes they're scams. So people will say, hey, we're here, to, you know, we smell a gas leak or something, you know, to that effect. That may be more on the, you know, just on the residential side, but it can go from residential, like I say, to large scale applications. So I think that's it for, for that. I don't know if there's any questions regarding that for video doorbells. If not, we'll just roll into surveillance. So surveillance, there's a, a wide range of security systems available. And the functionality is based upon the customer's desired wants and needs. Maybe it's just a burg alarm to protect when you know you, you leave the premise. Uh, it could be you're using that alarm at night when you're asleep. You know, someone has a bigger house, they're sleeping in one part of the house. You're really not going to know unless that system is armed if someone's entering or trying to break into, uh, you know, a location. Many consist of interior and exterior cameras, and it could be a layered approach. You know, in a lot of communities, what will happen is, you know, the layered approach is the first line of, of defense is a barrier gate. 
Now that barrier gate uh, can have a telephone entry system. So some communities have a, a guard from say eight to eight, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. After 8 p.m., because there's not as much traffic, then they would go to a telephone entry system. So whether it was audio only or similar to what we were just talking about, audio and video, the visitor would come up to the visitor entrance because typically in, in, in those gated communities, you're gonna have two entrances, one for the resident who will have some type of transmitter clicker or access control, whether it's a barcode on their vehicle. And as they approach, um, they'll, the, the card reader will read um, the barcode, read the key fob, they're an authorized person on that system and the gate will go up. On the visitor side, they would queue up, um, find the person's name on the LED, the, the, the display, and basically pull up Mrs. Jones, hit the call button, it would call her, and then she would validate, yes, um, here I have a delivery for you, or hi mom, it's me, let me in and they'll hit say number nine and or whatever you designate that, that digit on the touch tone to be on the keypad and it will open the gate. So that's our first line of defense. From there you have, you know, maybe it's a guard or maybe it's a, an exterior entrance where you wanna have um, cameras, whether it's just an overview camera to see who's coming in and out, maybe an LPR, a license plate reader camera. Now that license plate reader camera is specifically just for that. It, it will specifically look at the, the, the plate and give you the readout of the license plate number and the state that it's from. Typically in an application like that, you would put it uh, where you would catch the rear plate because some states like Pennsylvania don't have front plates. So you'll wanna catch the rear of the vehicle. So a lot of times you'll have an overview camera to see the vehicle approaching. Um, if you had a visitor uh, telephone entry system, you may have a tight shot to, to catch the person's face. And then as they depart and go through the barrier gate, you can uh, catch them with an LPR, a license plate reader camera. Some of the areas of uh, concerns for a lot of communities are dumping. Um, you know, they, they have areas designated where they'll have, uh, you know, waste drop off, whether it's, you know, for cardboard or other things like that. And in a lot of communities, they'll have contractors that live and work there. I mean, you know, live in that community. And at the end of the day, they'll do some illegal dumping, especially in non-gated communities where it's a little harder to get in, you know, they may come and dump. So we do a lot of um, areas where we'll put cameras up, they'll have remote connectivity and they can see what's going on. And, you know, it's funny, uh, the person that is gonna do that illegal dumping, he's the first one to look to see if there's cameras around. So along with cameras, signage is really critical to let people know, typically the bad guy, and, and I didn't say this in the beginning, but I'm retired NYPD detective. So, you know, it, it, for me, a lot of times you want to think like a bad guy. What would they do? What would be the most benefit for um, my customers to get the most out of the equipment that we're installing? So thinking like, uh, you know, uh, a, a bad guy and, and someone illegally dumping, is he a bad guy? No, he's just trying to get rid of, some, you know, his trash. But if he knows he's doing something wrong, you'll see them looking around to see if there's a camera. And that signage helps you in the long term because it makes people think and they act a little bit different when they know someone's being watched. Uh, lighting conditions, power requirements are always a key. In a lot of areas that they'll ask us to uh, provide a proposal, it's a remote dumpster that there's no power around where there's no internet, because typically you would want to have internet so you can view these uh, cameras remotely. Specifically, if you have, um, you know, for post event, so someone did dump something uh, in one of the communities that we're in right now, we put up barrier gates and invariably they've broken the barrier gates 
and they're in the process now of putting in cameras because, well, uh, it, the, the equipment's in, uh, inferior. No, I personally saw, and so did that, you know, a lot of other people that maybe someone was piggybacking through the barrier gate when it should be the gate, you know, you present the, either the transmitter, click the button, or you have a barcode, the barrier gate goes up, the next, you know, they go through it, they pass the closed loop and the barrier comes down. Sometimes people in, are impatient and they'll want to piggyback behind someone and then the barrier arm comes down on that vehicle. Uh, video retention, some of the things that are, are key and, and, and the thing for um, a lot of the communities, which you should always think about, the, the vendors that you choose, you should take a look if you have existing equipment, can the current vendor work on that specific equipment? You know, there are certain closed lines, meaning that you have to be an authorized dealer for a certain product or else you will not be able to get tech support. Tech support is the key because most companies can uh, obtain equipment even if they get it through a third party if they're not an authorized dealer. But uh, for instance, Cantech is a closed um, access control product that we're authorized dealers for. Now, if one of my techs calls Cantech, they absolutely cannot get tech support because they're gonna ask them for their specific ID that they've, uh, that they've passed the course and they know the product well. So one of the things, and, and, and I'll go through it, but one of the things that uh, you just wanna make sure when selecting a vendor that if it's the equipment that they're proposing or if it's equipment that you have, that they are authorized dealers for that specific product. You know, if someone tells you, oh, don't worry about it, I'll, I'll take care of it, unless you have a, a specific relationship with them and you know their doers and they'll get it done, no issues. But it's always good when, when the, the vendor that you choose can absolutely service and maintain that equipment in, in a productive manner. You know, if you send a tech there and they're not really uh, well versed on equipment, that one hour service call could be three hours because they can't sort something out because they don't have the knowledge or the training behind them. So um, another key is video retention. So you want to put cameras at the clubhouse. You want to put them at the front, uh, you know, the front entrance. How long do you want to record that data, that video, before it writes over the, the oldest? It's called FIFO, first in, first out, meaning that if I have a camera and I want to uh, record for 30 days, it's literally a mathematical calculation that, okay, at this, at a certain frame rate, um, at, a, at a certain type of, of camera resolution quality, I know that, okay, for 30 days on six cameras, I need a two terabyte. So there is a, there's a calculator that you put in. So th those things are key uh, when you're selecting a vendor and making sure that you relay the information of how long you want to retain data. You know, a lot of times for most of the, most of the, the communities we deal with are 30 days, but there are some that want 60, 90, you know, they want a year. I mean, you know, year, then you're talking just so much money because video takes up a, a decent amount of storage. Um, and that's it, uh, you know, remote connectivity is key. Um, you know, we retrofitted a, a community about a year ago that they had these boxes at each one of the entrances. They had four entrances and they, they had no remote connectivity. So each time an incident occurred, literally someone would have to go out to the box with a monitor and, and take a look and see what was going on. Makes no sense, you know. A deterrent for a, a possible a potential wrongdoer. You know, many of these people will look at a location simply for the mere fact that it has security, whether it's gated, that it has cameras. They'll they'll look at this community and say, you know, let me go somewhere else. Unless they have a specific target or a specific uh, um, reason why they wanted to go to this community, I would say eight times out of ten the wrongdoer or someone who is a potential wrongdoer will look somewhere else. Great thing about these, uh, you know, these video NVRs network video recorder is you can download that video for law enforcement. Maybe there was uh, an accident that occurred 
Um, maybe there was an incident that occurred, slip and fall. So you're at the clubhouse. Somebody claims that they, they, you know, something happened that they fell, trip and fell. I mean, obviously, if it's past that 30 days or the specified time that you wanted to record, then it would be past the point. But you have the ability, if there was an incident, that you can record it to say a thumb drive and retain that uh, the data for a possible lawsuit coming up. And that's, you know, lastly for, for this slide, it's critical to choose that right vendor. You know, there are, word of mouth is a great thing. And that's what we, you know, when we talk uh, and we talk to potential new customers, you know, we tell them we have um, references to beat the band. And it's good to, to call them because you can see what's the response time. You know, when, when, when you call, how quickly do they get there? Um, for us, we deal with some, you know, retailers and we have a four hour response time for say fire alarms that we have a contract that states we have to be there within four hours. So, you know, it's just important in choosing the right vendor for a lot of different um, technologies that are out there. Next thing we'll talk about. Hey, Jackie, how are we doing with the time? We have about five more minutes, Joe. Okay, yeah. good. So virtual uh, guardhouses can, ha can help save money during non-critical or busy times. So this we were talking about earlier with the 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. And, and a, virtual, um, a virtual guard can be just as simple as a telephone entry system where the call is placed to the to the TES to the telephone entry system by a visitor ring someone's doorbell like we talked earlier um, and enabling them to grant access, whether it's to the barrier gate to get in, whether it's to get to the lobby so they can drop packages off after hours or open up that gate. The MDU is the same we were talking about earlier, kind of jumped around a little bit, but the same thing where it can be audio only, audio and video. Um, and both of them um, have the ability to display the video for the specific uh, caller that they are um, trying to get in touch with. Virtual concierge. Um, one of the things with virtual, it's basically like a, a central station. So what will happen is they'll press a button and it will call a central station. You'll speak to a live person and they may, you know, they'll, they will, instead of you talking direct to the customer, uh, I mean, to the, the, the tenant or the renter, you would talk to a virtual concierge and they would let the person in. They'll have a list similar to what a guard does um, at a guard booth, you'll pull up, I'm here to see Mrs. Jones, no problem. Uh, virtual concierge will just eliminate that body at um, the guard booth and give them the ability of basically saving some man hours because it's not as busy and will allow them to unlock, validate who's there, not let them in uh, if it's uh, you know unauthorized and basically just taking it taking it from there. Just another uh, way of trying to save some money, especially on those after hours when there's not a lot of uh, um, deliveries happening. Typically, like I said earlier, eight to eight is, is the norm where they'd like to save some money. So on that eight hour overnight from 8P to 8A, there's not as much traffic. A lot of communities still have a 24 hour guard just because there is a decent amount of traffic or that's how they sell and promote their, their property as 24 hour manned security. Uh, final thoughts, as with any service provider, it's essential to look at the previous performance of the vendor. That's why references, uh, references are so critical. Do they have a good track record? You know, do, um, do they, do they come when they say they're going to come? I mean, I can't tell you how many times someone will call and they said, oh, you called back. 
I don't know what other companies do, but I can tell you, I'm the owner of technicality and someone calls, we jump on it right away. I mean, we get references all the time. And, and uh, if I'm in the car, I shouldn't be doing it. I'm making calls or so, or some of my other guys that are out in the field uh, doing sales. I mean, it, it, it's all about, for us, it's never about the money. It's about taking care of the customer because if you're happy, the money will come. And, you know, we're always thinking 10 years out, um, you know, when it comes to providing security. And, and a lot of times what we'll do is, hey, we're doing the cameras. Do you need any, any work on your fire alarm, bird alarm? No, we have somebody. I never try to poach. But at the end of the day, I said, I'm here. If something happens and you need, uh, you know, additional services, we're here to help in any way we can. Because, you know, for us, karma is a great thing. Um, and, you know, as long as you, like I say, as long as you take care of the customer, then, then in return, they'll take care of you. Well, we do have a few questions for you, Joe, if you're ready. Okay. Yep. All right. Are there any places in the community that, um, that they forget, that they typically can forget place cameras? If you're looking at that. Okay. Yeah, you know, I mean, dumpsters are, are really... Uh, a big area and what we're finding now we're putting a lot of access control on on pools and on, on gyms and on tennis courts you know a lot of uh, communities you know they may put if someone's in arrears they can um they can isolate and grant access only to say maybe the clubhouse but these peripherals where maybe they, they're in arrears so they're not allowed to go to the pool or to the gym um, what can you do, or let me read this right. What can you do to put a camera on your door without invading the privacy of the neighbor? Well, put it this way. There's no expectation of privacy in a public place. So as long as your camera is not looking into someone's, you know, um, directly into their house, there is really no expectation of privacy at all. So I don't see an issue you know, uh, everybody's concerned about Big Brother watching, but you know, I'm I'm from the mindset that it's your property. If you want to protect it, then you have every right, and there's no expectation in a in a public place. So if you know, as long as you're not looking into someone's, you know, house. I mean, sometimes it's difficult the way if you are are in say in a townhouse community and you look directly across, but at that point, you know, you could angle that in such a way that you're not invading uh, anyone's privacy. All right, and for data that's retained on a cloud, what are the costs associated with that storage? You know, typically if you're in the cloud, it, it, everything is relative. I mean, it could be as simple as maybe you have a 16 channel recorder and you just want to, um, it's typically a per camera cost. So it could be anywhere from 10 to $25 per camera feed. You know, the cloud is just not there yet. I mean, we're dealers for Verkata, which is in a lot of schools. So just as, as a, a point of fact, a Verkata camera is about, um, in, sorry, let me just shut that off. Sorry, I'm in my vehicle because I had an appointment and so I'm sure you can see behind me. But anyway, uh, say a Verkata Berg a camera is, is probably about 1500 for the for the camera itself, or a normal one would be anywhere from two, 250 to 500 uh, where you have local storage. And then it could be anywhere from, like I say, $10 to 25 a month. I'm sorry, 30 a month. All right, if anybody else has any other questions for Joe, please feel free to throw them into that Q&A box. I do have one more for Gabe. Um, how do we correct the collapse of walls within a wet basin? Within a wet basin. So the only reason a catch basin would be wet would be following a rainstorm. Now, usually, traditionally within 24 hours, that catch basin will be dry. Uh, if the catch basin, and if I'm understanding the question correctly, if the catch basin is constantly wet, you're probably going to want to call the irrigation company because you probably have a sprinkler line that's leaking. Uh, we dealt with that not too long ago where we went to repair the catch basin three different times. And every time we went, it was, uh, there was just water everywhere on the walls and you can't work with concrete when there's 
water presence. And uh, it was like following like a week of dry weather. And we're like, yeah, you got, you got a sprinkler leak somewhere that's just allowing water to flow in underground. Um, so I don't know if I understood that question probably, but if the catch basin is wet uh, and you have 48 hours of um, no rain, dry weather, then uh, you, you have some sort of irrigation uh, leak somewhere. But uh, traditionally, we just wait until it's dry enough and uh, get in there and replace the blocks, rebuild her, charge her up, and uh, good to go. All right. Well, that is all the questions I have for right now. Uh, I'd just like to thank both Joe and Gabe for participating today. We will be sharing the speaker's contact information with all of our attendees, so feel free to reach out to them if you think of any other questions. Otherwise, we hope to see you soon at one of our upcoming events or at our next Wednesday webinar. Thank you both. Thank great. you. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. You too.